Welcome to the North Shore Fellowship Podcast, a place to explore the intersection of God's story and our lives. My name is Chris, and I'm sitting here again with Heather, Jason, and John. Last time we talked about the temple, and one of the things that we didn't talk a whole lot about is the priest. And yet, all temples have priests, somebody that serves in the temple, has some kind of function. Um, So to go back to the beginning again, last time we started in Genesis, looking at how uh, the Eden, the Garden of Eden is is like a temple in some ways. Did the Garden of Eden have priests? What do you think, John? Yeah, so as as we do read Genesis 1 and 2, and we see some of those connections throughout the Old Testament made with Eden, and if you're convinced of this temple mount imagery that we find there, which I think you should, I do think is in there, uh, we do have priests. Uh, we have Adam and Eve, and one of the way that we best understand Adam and Eve is as royal priests, uh, royal in the sense of they are vice regents, this sort of vice king, vice queen under God's rule and reign, and they are priests in that they are given tasks to do. Like a priest in a temple would do specific things for the deity in any ancient temple. They would offer sacrifices. They would protect the temple. They might clean it, but they would be given very specific instructions as to what they were supposed to do. Well, Adam and Eve are given instructions by God. They are to procreate and multiply, to fill the earth with more of these image bearers. And they are to maintain and have dominion over Eden. Uh, They're actually called to garden first. So the first job really would have been gardening in that sense. But all the other tasks that humanity does, or at least most of them, um, they're good things. We find out how the world works, see God's handiwork in it, and use creation to make other beautiful things. Uh, That's actually humanity doing some really good stuff. They are uh, working as priests figuring this thing out. Regular listeners won't be shocked to know that when we think of what a priest does, we go straight back to Genesis for uh, that answer. So well done, JT. Thanks for staying on brand. We appreciate that. Um, regular listeners also will know that we tend to connect these things to the, to the New Testament as well. And so um, when we see Jesus as the true priest who really fulfills this road, that doesn't mean that we don't have a role to play. And um, as as God established his, uh, his covenant with Abraham and made a nation from him, he called that people a, a royal priesthood. He called it a holy nation, a kingdom of priests set apart for his own purposes. The whole nation kind of had this priestly responsibility uh, to represent God to the world and how they lived according to his law. Um, so much of the Old Testament law code was about the perfection of Yahweh and representing his perfection to themselves and the world. And even though they were called a royal priesthood, not everyone was doing temple work proper, which is a big deal. That's right. That's right. So even in their quote unquote secular work, they're demonstrating God's perfection. Right. Yeah. So you come to the New Testament then, and again, just like we don't get rid of the temple, we don't get rid of the concept of priest because... Uh, Jesus is making us to be what he is. He's making us priests, and he has made us a a priest and kingdom um, for his God. So uh, 1 Peter can call us a royal priesthood and a holy nation, just like Israel was. Okay, so as you all talk about us being royal priests, God calling his entire nation to be a royal priesthood, we, the New Testament also talks about how we are the living stones, how we're part of this actual temple building. And as we look in First Kings, where we're going to be looking at Solomon constructing the temple, it's also um, very detailed and descriptive. So can you help me make a connection to how that fits in with us? Yeah. So if you're asking... Where in the Bible would we go to start learning about temple construction? Where do you think the answer would be? JT, should I say Genesis 1 and 2? All right. So Adam and Eve are given the task of expanding Eden, right, to the ends of the world. They're, they're multiplying their images. They're, um, you know, working with the soil, working with the stones that God has provided, and they're expanding this out so that God's presence is going to be multiplied. Um, that, that, 
construction project, if you will, or that transformation project of the, of the world, um, is, um, is a little bit different when you have the construction of the tabernacle and the temple. But what's notable about it is that it still involves people. This is so important, I think, um, because we tend to think of the construction of the temple as either something Solomon did or something Jesus does, and we don't do anything. We don't have anything to do with that. Um, God did not bring a t- tabernacle and a temple down out of heaven totally, completely complete. Uh, he gave humans the blueprint. He gave human craftsmen in the book of Exodus his spirit. The first people who are explicitly said to be full of the Holy Spirit are men who will work with wood and linen and stone and gems to uh, create uh, the the tabernacle and the things that go in the tabernacle. Uh, and so the, I think the same thing is true when you come to the New Testament. When you think of the church as living stones being built together into the temple, um, it's proper for us to say, yeah, God's at work doing that, but we can't stop there. We also need to see ourselves as having a role, being filled with the Spirit so that we will contribute to the construction of that household and that community, that family, uh, the building up of, of God's people into one great, um, one great temple for the living God that fills the whole world. That construction effort also includes our own pursuit of sanctification, our own pursuit of holy lives. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, a dynamic building. It's not a static building like the temple. It's a building that lives and moves and breathes. And so when you and I go about our daily labors and we offer them unto the Lord, when we do them in his name, uh, we, we avoid things like grumbling and complaining and we, we work as unto the Lord, not just as unto our, for the sake of our earthly master's happiness. When we're doing things like that, we are transforming our lives and even in a, another way, the, the world around us into holy space uh, that represents God, who he is, uh, how he wants his, his work to be uh, um, manifest in the world. Yeah, that's really good. And so as we go about this priestly work, uh, again, I love the fact that Jason alluded to the Exodus passage um, where the men are empowered by the Spirit of God to help build the tabernacle first time the Spirit shows up in that way. Um, so that means as you go about your daily life, there really is a beautiful priestly function in bringing God's presence, um, a holy space to bear all around you. Like, for example, Heather mentioned that there were living stones. So that means if you go out and love your neighbor and you actually tell them about Jesus and tell them about the sacrifice that was made for your sin, pointing them to the one, that's a very wonderful priestly act that they actually might join part of this construction. They might become members of this living temple uh, and trusting in what Jesus has done for them. But also, as you go about your work, as we mentioned, um, the, the people of Israel called a royal priesthood, a holy nation that's likened to the church, but all those people and the work they did was not temple work proper. That really is important to remember. And so just because you don't work for the church, quote unquote, does not mean your work has any less value or is less priestly in that sense. So for the stay at home mom that seeks to love her kids well, to raise them in righteousness and like to bring these living stones up in covenant nurture. That is wonderful priestly work for the entrepreneur or business owner that thinks about how could gleaning laws, most peculiar laws on Leviticus that apply to loving the poor. Well, if he thinks through how, who he can hire and why, and, and like paying a fair wage, that is a wonderful priestly work. Again, revealing God's character and how they go about their business. The student that, uh, obeys their teacher and that is a kind classmate again like like you're, you're you feel that sense of everything we do and we're told that every thought captive i mean every thought is to be taken captive to the obedience of christ and so if our very thought life is meant to be brought under his lordship i think it easily is throughout the scriptures you could point to many references where what we do is to be as unto the lord every facet of our lives and as we do so we are living that royal priestly life and bringing God's character, showing it forth and bringing his presence to bear to the watching world. I don't think of myself much as, um, you know, a construction expert or an architect, but what you see when the new creation appears at the end of revelation, at the end of the story, you see God taking on board the things of this world, the things of the kingdoms of this world and making them his own. 
he's not he's not remaking the world so that human work is done away with but somehow he's taking all the contributions that we've made and and transforming them a couple, you see this in a couple of spaces now, you see this when revelation says you know there's this great proclamation that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our god uh, and of his messiah and you see this in the way that uh, the the gemstones and the gold and, and and the like that are mentioned in Revelation are not gemstones as found in nature, but they're gemstones as found in nature after humans have worked with them. They're transformed, uh, they're polished, they're cut. Uh, the gold is beaten very very finely until it's translucent. Uh, and you also see references of the kings coming into uh, New Jerusalem and bringing their treasure into it. And so whatever it is that we're doing, we get the we get to believe and hope that God is actually going to take our contributions in every sphere of what we're doing in every place where we work Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, and use that to build the kingdom that he ultimately wants to have uh, all over the world. And I think if there's any doubt that is this temple imagery and us as royal priests that really like a theme of scripture, these important themes running throughout? Again, Revelation 21 and 22, very important chapters. We sort of see the glimpse of the end of the age and sort of the age to come. Just again, when John sees the new heaven and new earth, the first heaven and first earth that passed away, again, we see kings bringing their glory into it. And then you have this very important phrase. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And that dwelling place is that famous tabernacle word in the Greek. And so the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Like that is like very foundational to the entire story of scripture. And this is the new heavens and new earth. Eden has expanded. It has been cultivated. It has been consummated. God with people people with God. This is the hope of the Christian faith. You could even say it's why Jesus died. Um, so to go back to Revelation again, to dip into that, Revelation 5, 9, and 10, by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. So that priestly royal identity and the priestly royal vocation uh, is going to be fulfilled. That's why Jesus died. And we get to start participating in that now. That's not something we wait for uh, to, to Jesus for Jesus' return. As fruitless as it might feel at times, that's not true. That your work does matter. Everything you do matters. And kings will bring their glory into the new creation. And uh, we can work that way. We can live that way. That gives meaning to everything we do. John, when you say that, that makes me excited about what God has called each of us to and the work that he has for us and how he's using every detail of our lives to show us, to show the world who he is. It makes me think of what Jason said in the first uh, session that we did on the temple, the last time's podcast, where he said, what happens in heaven doesn't stay in heaven. So God is actually using us to bring his glory to this earth. Absolutely, Heather. That's so encouraging to think that God is using us, and that is his plan from the start. There's a very familiar verse in Ephesians 2, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. And then there's another verse after it that people don't tend to memorize, but it's great. It says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship. We're like the temple. We're, we're crafted with skill and intentionality. And there's something really redemptive and wonderful about that. It restores our dignity that we are his workmanship and we were created for good works and the good works that he has prepared in, in advance so that we would walk in them. So all of that is so encouraging as we think about the temple and this week as we've zoomed in and, and talked more particularly about the fact that we are priests of this temple that's being built by Christ, his church, his kingdom, and he has called us to serve him 
in the ordinary aspects of our daily lives as we seek to be faithful in all things, loving one another, and doing jobs well. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of the North Shore Fellowship Podcast. 